This week, I've been inspired by the splendors of Moscow. I've seen great and impressive statues, magnificent cathedrals. I've visited the public park at the exhibition ground with its breathtaking statues and water fountains. I've traveled on Russia's metro system, one of the most fabulous in the world. It is written. This is Henry Feyerabend presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. From the city of Moscow, our subject is When the Walls Came Tumbling Down. Down in the city of Moscow, there's a monument to Alexander Pushkin, a man who loved the city Otherwise, he could not have written these significant words. Moscow. What thoughts in each true-hearted Russian come flooding at that word? How deep an echo there is heard. Yesterday, walking through Red Square, I was haunted with the awesome feeling of being a part of the significant history of the last decades. At the tomb of Lenin, I was fascinated as I watched the colorful ceremony of the changing of the guards. Day and night they stand over the tomb of a dead man. The tomb of a man whose influence has dominated the lives of a large sector of the human race for the better part of this century. Lenin was a man with a dream. Who can fault the principles of his noble quest? His words have a ring of authenticity. He said, in contrast to the old society with its economical miseries and its political delirium, a new society is springing up whose international rule will be peace because its national rules will be everywhere the same, labor. Lenin was a great admirer of Karl Marx. In fact, of Marx, he said, his name will last forever. Lenin said, Marx's doctrine is omnipotent because it is right. Rather interesting that a man who would not believe in an omnipotent God did believe in an omnipotent Marx. Up on Lenin's hill, right where I am standing, the founders of communism pounded out their new ideas as they worked and studied to find a way to guarantee the freedom of the people of Russia. And as they came up with their ideas, they said, the sun shone brightly over Moscow. All of Moscow looked up to us. We joined hands and walked through life together. Oh yes, it was a beautiful dream, but something happened. That wonderful dream turned into a terrible nightmare. What went wrong? Those godless atheistic theories of Marx, of Engels, and Lenin would not stand the test of time. Yes, they talked about giving people freedom, but the opposite happened. Totalitarianism, oppression. A police force that became so powerful that every one of the people of Russia felt that they were being watched day and night. Their property was confiscated without compensation, as was the produce of the peasants. And soon religious liberty came to a grinding halt. Churches were either torn down or transformed into warehouses or centers for communist propaganda. The walls of the Kremlin still look down upon Red Square. Those walls that formed such a wonderful defense in times past with their 120 watchtowers, walls that were as high as 19 meters in places and as thick as six and a half meters. On the top of those walls were 1,045 Marilyns or little slits behind which the soldiers could hide and fire at the oncoming enemy. But there was another wall that emerged, a wall not made with brick and mortar. Westerners referred to it as the Iron Curtain. It was a symbol of the Cold War. 
and along with the Iron Curtain came the Berlin Wall. And many students of Bible prophecy wondered how these walls would ever collapse because they seemed to form a formidable barrier against the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I remember reading the commentary of a 19th century writer who predicted that in the final events, the last events will be rapid ones. And I believed that this would be true, but I never thought they would be that rapid. How quickly, how suddenly the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall collapsed. What went on be behind those walls? Westerners wondered. Was there any freedom? The Russian people had a favorite song. The words went something like this. I know of no other country where man breathes so freely. But at the same time they were singing this song, one out of ten of their people were behind bars. And it has come to light that Stalin exterminated millions of his own people. Until recently, Lenin was a great hero in this city with statues gracing the parks. But something happened. The famous became infamous. And if you should visit Lenin's tomb today, you might find, as we did, people who had suffered under oppression shouting obscenities, cursing the man who had caused them so much trouble. In 1924, when Lenin died, the city of Petrograd changed its name to the city of Leningrad in his honor. But as soon as the Iron Curtain fell, they were very anxious to change their name again now to St. Petersburg. And even streets that bore the name of Lenin have changed the names of those streets. It seems as if history continues to repeat itself. It seems as if human beings refuse to learn the lessons that God has for them. Back in Bible times, in the days of Joshua, there was a city by the name of Jericho. And it had huge impregnable walls, and the people confided in those walls. They felt so safe behind those walls. At that time, the armies of Israel were approaching, and God had predicted that the city of Jericho would fall and would be taken over by the people of Israel. But how could the Israeli armies negotiate those walls? It seemed impossible. But those walls, like the Iron Curtain, like the Berlin Wall, fell suddenly. You know the story. We sing about it in the old black spiritual. Joshua hit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Earlier in Bible history, almost at the dawn of the history of the Bible, after the, the worldwide flood, human beings decided that they were going to build a godless society. And so they decided to, to build a tower which would be a monument to labor. It would be a monument to the skill of their hands, but actually it turned out to be a monument of apostasy. It turned out to be a citadel of defiance against the God of heaven. We read about this in the book of Genesis, the 11th chapter. After the flood, the people said the words we find in verse 4, and they said, Go, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. What was the goal of this construction? They didn't want to be scattered. But like Lenin, their godless plan failed. In fact, it turned out just the opposite of what they had hoped. It turned out that they were scattered, for we read the words of God in verse 7. God said, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. God brought swift and decisive action to confuse their plans, and that was the origin of the many languages and dialects that we have in the world today, over 3,000 of them. Can't you just imagine the scene? There are those workers industriously working on their tower, and one says to the other, please give me a hammer. And the next one says, was sagst du? Ich kann nicht verstehen. And the third one uh, said, non comprendo, non sé, okay, was ist da diciendo? 
And the fourth one shrugs his shoulders and says, Yen is nigh. In the very spot of that failed tower, proud Nebuchadnezzar began to work building a city. A city such as was never conceived of by the mind of men. It was one of the wonders of the world, and of course, it had its walls. Massive walls to protect that city. Behind those walls lived a man by the name of Daniel. He spent 70 years there. 70 years witnessing to those atheistic people about the power of God. And Daniel prophesied that Babylon would fall. And it wasn't only Daniel. There were other prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all in all, more than 100 prophecies, some of them minute, telling not only that Babylon would fall, but how it would fall. But the people of Babylon were confident. How could anyone destroy their city? They had their guards on the walls, throwing boulders, melted lead on any soldiers who would dare to come near the walls. And so when Cyrus and his armies came from the rising of the sun, the Persian armies came to siege the city of Babylon. The residents of that city laughed Cyrus to scorn and an utter contempt to the Persians and to the God of heaven who had made those prophecies. They decided to have a giant party, a mother of all parties a drunken orgy while they were partying. Cyrus was negotiating the walls. He couldn't come over around. He decided to bring his army into the city under the walls on the bed of the river Euphrates. And even then they couldn't have had access to the city because of the two leaved gates that separated the river bed from the streets of the city. But that night the people had forgotten the gates open. All of this fulfilling a prophecy given by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 45 when he said, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. What a marvelous prophecy! when you realize that this prophecy was made 174 years before it actually happened. And even more amazing, Cyrus here was named more than a hundred years before he was even born. King Belshazzar was at his party when the armies came in, and that night King Belshazzar lost his life, or as in the words of Edward Arnold, that night they slew him on his father's throne, the hand unnoticed, the deed unknown. Crownless, scepterless Belshazzar lay, a robe of purple round a form of clay. Like the walls of Jericho, the walls of Babylon came tumbling down. Here we are, standing on Red Square. I have a question. Is there a lesson that we can learn from what happened here? Is it important to people in Canada, in the United States? I believe there is a lesson we can learn. For you see, Bible prophecy never fails. Bible prophecy doesn't guess, it knows. And prophecy will be fulfilled. It seemed as if the Iron Curtain and the Berlin would never fall, but fall they did. What will be the next wall to come down? Will it be the Bamboo Curtain? Many people believe that it will. We now go to the Bible book of Revelation. And here we encounter Babylon again. Only this time we're not talking about that old city in Iraq that was destroyed 2,500 years ago. Revelation points us to a spiritual city of Babylon, a city that will also fall. I open God's Word into Revelation, the 14th chapter, and here we have these words that come from the book of God. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, 
is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And over in Revelation 18, verse 2, he says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Here we have a picture of spiritual Babylon, religious confusion, apostate religion, drunk with the wine of the wrath of Babylon. Have you ever tried to reason with an intoxicated person? I have, and I soon learned that it was, it was an exercise in futility. Because people, when they're intoxicated, simply cannot reason. <laughs> what a picture God gives us of spiritual intoxication. People are spiritually intoxicated, and that's why they simply cannot understand the simple truths of the prophetic word of God. They are in a spiritual drunken stupor. But religious confusion will fall. Like the old city of Babylon, spiritual Babylon will fall. You and I have a ringside seat from which we can see world events rushing by at breakneck speed. The metronome of time is clicking faster than it has ever clicked before. Bible prophecy is so amazing. In the 13th chapter of Revelation, we have a word picture, a picture of a nation arising in the 18th century, growing up like a plant, far from the masses of Europe. This country grows and it is pictured as coming up like a lamb. For you see, about at that time, people were oppressed there was no religious freedom, especially in Europe. And how they longed to be able to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. They longed for a country without a king, for a church without a pope. And to the shores of North America they flocked. And there they formed a constitution that would protect their religious liberty men like Thomas Jefferson began to build. They began to erect a wall. They called it the wall of separation between church and state. And what a wonderful wall it was. In the shadow of that wall, people finally found the religious liberty that they were looking for. But did you know that at this very moment people are working to tear down that wall. There are forces at work which will bring back the totalitarianism of the past. A recent book by Malachi Martin, Jesuit priest from Vatican City, refers to this wall as a barrier to a new world order. <laughs> but worse than that, Americans are echoing what he said. No wonder in Time magazine in 1991 we have uh, these words. The low moaning sound in the background just might be the founding fathers protesting from the grave. I find it amazing to hear a popular television evangelist, a Protestant preacher, saying that the wall that separates church and state could be part of the Russian constitution, but not of the American constitution. Another great preacher has referred to this wall as the figment of some atheist's imagination. And a Supreme Court justice has said that this wall has no value at all, that it is based on a bad metaphor of history, and that it should be plainly and clearly abandoned. In the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, we see this nation arising like a lamb, but it begins to speak as 
a dragon. Forces are at work to tear down the wall of separation of church and state. And history proves that whenever that wall has been tampered with, persecution has raised its ugly head. Wherever that wall has fallen, there has been bitter oppression and persecution. The Bible tells us that there is another time of persecution coming. There is no doubt about it. Forces are already at work to bring it about. And Revelation 13 describes exactly what will happen. Revelation chapter 13, reading verses 16 and 17. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Yes, history does repeat itself. Man continues to commit the same mistakes and the future seems to hold more religious persecution. At the beginning of this program, I referred to Russian poet Alexander Pushkin and some of the words that he wrote. I'd like to read a bit from another one of his poems. Here's what he said. I shall not perish entirely in my sacred lyre. My soul shall outlive my dust and escape corruption. That, my friend, is the hope of humanity. Our hope isn't in any human walls. Our hope is that all of us can escape corruption and live forever, and that's what God promises. God is preparing a city for you and me with walls that will never come tumbling down. We read about those walls in Revelation 21. I read in verse 17, verse 18 that is, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. God is building beautiful walls for you and me that will never come crashing down. How I've enjoyed visiting the city of Moscow and getting to know some of its wonderful people. There is pain written in many faces, a result of years of oppression. Yes, Moscow has its problems just like our North American cities do. People still have pain. There is sickness. There are hospitals, just like in our North American cities. And all of us face death. Yes, Moscow has its cemeteries. But God has promised that all of this will pass if we will only claim his promises. I read in Revelation 21, verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Friend, in the past few minutes we've been talking about oppression, about suffering, about problems, about walls. We cannot depend on any walls of human building. If we do, we'll fail. But God is inviting you, my friend, to depend on promises that will not fail. Nothing like the promises of Lenin. Nothing like any human promises. He is preparing a place for you and me. The important thing is, have you claimed his promises? Are you ready to accept his claims on your life? Will you turn your life over to him right now? and be a part of those wonderful promises. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, looking into your word, we see the amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy, and we know we are living in serious times. How we look forward to your coming reign. May each one of us be ready to meet you in the day of your coming, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.
I'm here with Mark Finley, who is conducting a giant evangelistic crusade in the Olympic Stadium of Moscow. Thousands and thousands of people are pressing in every afternoon and every evening to hear the Word of God. The largest Bible class of the world is being conducted with almost four million Bible lessons and 150,000 Bibles distributed. There is so much inspiration and excitement, I would like to share it with you. Mark is writing a book about his experience here in Moscow, and we want you to have a copy. Please write or phone. Here is the information that you need. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our Canadian national toll-free number 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, 1-800-253-3000. Remember, your gift is sent free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the gift you're requesting. Call toll-free now from anywhere in Canada, one 800 Two five three three thousand. Lines are open twenty four hours daily. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written, Box twenty ten, Oshawa, Ontario, L one H seven V four. And thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your generous financial support. Write It Is Written, Box twenty ten, Oshawa, Ontario, L one H seven V four. And now the time has come to say goodbye from the city of Moscow. Mark and I look forward to being with you again next week at this same time. And remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <laughs>